Hello, everyone, and welcome to AISC's live webinar on high-strength bolts. Today's webinar is being presented by Dr. Joff Kulak, Emeritus Professor at the University of Alberta. My name is Brent Liu. I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I will be moderating today's presentation. And with that, I'd like to get going with today's presentation. I want to introduce today's speaker, Joff Kulak. Dr. Joff Kulak is Professor Emeritus in the University of Alberta's Department of Civil Engineering and is one of North America's leading experts on bolted connections. He is the author of AISC's Design Guide 17, High Strength Bolts, a Primer for Engineers. Throughout his career, he's been honored on many occasions, and among those many honors is the AISC Special Achievement Award that he received in 2000 for his work on the second edition of the Guide to Design Criteria for Bolted and Riveted Joints. We're very pleased to have Dr. Kulak presenting AISC's live webinar today. Welcome, Dr. Kulak, and with that, I'll hand control over to you. Thanks, Brent. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. What we're covering is fundamentals and behavior. It's not connection design per se, and you should appreciate the, the difference. AISC does a lot of education in this area. Uh, it's directed at uh, the design features. We're directing our remarks towards, do you understand what you're doing? And the specification requirements that go along when we deal with them are uh, the AISC uh, 2010. So I'm assuming that you are all structural engineers. It doesn't have to be that way, but I've got to address somebody since I can't see you. So in my mind, you're a structural engineer. And uh, the role of the structural engineer or mechanical engineer in some cases is to pick the right bolts uh, and types and grades, to design the fasteners, to be responsible for the installation, and to be responsible for the inspection. There's nobody else to do those jobs. You're the, you're the person in the office that's had the course that you're getting now, and you're going to be responsible and can do these jobs, particularly the installation and inspection. A307 bolts, to start, uh, are often a good choice when loads are static. Uh, the strength level is inferior to the ones that we're going to discuss in a moment, and which we're going to discuss mostly. And its tensile strength is about it's, uh, 60 KSI. If we need to have pretension in our joints, and I'll be saying a lot about that during the course of the presentation, so don't panic if you don't understand it right now, uh, the amount of pretension will be indeterminate for A307 bolts. Now, there are two grades of high strength bolts. Uh, A325 and the second one, which is coming along. A325 bolts come in two types, type 1 or type 3. Type 3 is weathering steel. Otherwise, there's no difference. So you don't have to distinguish between those two. If you're doing a, bi a bridge in weathering steel, presumably you'd use the weathering steel uh, fastener type 3. But for today's purposes, type 1 or type 3, everything in terms of strength, falls out uh, no, with no problem, no issues. Now the minimum tensile strength is 120 KSI. That's double what it was for A307 volts. So we're, we're already at a very high strength level. If we need pretension, as I've advertised, there's lots to come on that, then we can get it here uh, with these bolts. A490 bolts uh, follow a similar pattern. Uh, type 1 or type 3, which I just explained. The minimum tensile strength now is 150 KSI, so we're really up there. These are very high strength steels. You'll notice, though, that there's a maximum now uh, listed. It's 170. Steel is very ductile, but it's not infinitely ductile. You can't abuse it. Uh, and at these strength levels, it's deemed, based on uh, research work, that we shouldn't go above 170 KSI with A490 bolts. Now, there's a linkage, which was also true for A325 bolts, that says ASDM specification on one side and Research Council on Structural Connections 
specification on the other hand. The ASDM spec says basically here's the chemistry, here's a bunch of other stuff, none of which we use in the design process. What it says is here's our product, you have to use it in accordance with another specification. And that's the one on the right hand side of the figure, the Research Council on Structural Connection Specification. There's a lot of good information in that. There's a lot of stuff there that you have to do. I doubt that many of you are familiar with this at the moment, but you're going to be, and I'll show you how to get that specification. If we need pretension, as was the case for A490, A325 bolts, uh, if we want it, then we can get it with this steel uh, also. Better to look at things uh, graphically. What I've just been saying is here on this image. Uh, so we have bolt tension, uh, which is obtained in a tension test. Uh, first for, let's use the 8, 7 8 inch diameter, 837 bolt. So what does that look like? Well, that's, that looks like mild steel. It's not really different than that. There is a, a, a region in the, at the knee here where it's not quite, it's, it's rounded. Uh, steel at these, these levels doesn't have a well-defined uh, stress-strain curve or a low deformation curve. If we go up to the 7 8 inch diameter A325 bolt, obviously it's gone up in strength. You'll notice also, though, that the ductility has gone down a little bit. Again, emphasizing that steel is inherently ductile, but if you keep abusing it, uh, it gives up on ductility. And finally, the A490 bolt, higher again in terms of strength, and uh, again, a slightly reduced uh, ductility. In all of those, in those discussions that we just completed, I kept quoting the ultimate tensile strength of the bolt. Now, why? Is, is my bolt in tension? Maybe it's in shear. The why is we've got to have a benchmark, and the benchmark is the tensile test. That's, the, that's easy to do for the manufacturer. It's relatively inexpensive. So that's, that's all that means. Sometimes bolts are in tension, in which case there would be a direct one-to-one -one relationship. But if the bolt is in shear, this is still the starting point. The ultimate tensile strength is the starting point. So along the way, we're going to have to uncover things like, well, what's the relationship between material in my bolt, which is acting in shear, and the bolt that is acting in shear and tension? So we have to establish that. And there are two questions or uh, comments at the bottom of this image. What about the yield strength and what about proof load? Well, what about them? I put them on here because they don't play any role in the design rules or in your design of the fasteners. I don't know, why are they there? I don't, they're kind of an aggravation, frankly. Uh, they play no role when you design that fastener. Proof load, proof load is the lo load level up to which you can load and then unload without a certain amount of, exceeding a certain amount of uh, permanent strength uh, uh, set. Again, it plays no role in the design and the behavior of the fastener. Yes, I know it's in the spec. Don't let it bother me. Trust me. You can send me an email saying, did you really mean that? The answer is yes. Uh, nuts are done on the basis of we'll provide, we will require that you provide nuts that are strong enough for that bolt grade. In other words, although the mechanical engineer can design that fastener, uh, that's too expensive to work at that level. We just say, make them strong enough for that application. So the nuts that you, are, which are prescribed, and there's a, a table and specification for that, uh, will be enough, strong enough, to uh, prevent any premature uh, failure of the bolt itself. So the implication that I'm talking about bolts, nuts, washer sets, uh, but other configurations, there are other ways of doing this, and I'll show those as time goes on. Uh, some, by and large, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to say what the specification did this time around, but there are a few places where I will. This is one of them. There's a, a change in bolt notation. Uh, bolts of a similar strength 
are put into a certain group called group A, and bolts of another strength are put into another group called group B. You follow the logic. It's not very deep. Uh, so this suits the people who are writing like the handbook uh, to have it lumped like that so that they can put out tables that fit group A category or group B category. But again, this doesn't play any role in our life except as designers we have to know which category we're in. Okay, moving on. I'm just going to spend a few minutes on how bolts get loaded, and then before too long we'll say uh, what the resistance is. So under a category called shear, load transfer is by shear in the bolt and bearing in the connected material. Or it's a load transfer by friction uh, followed by shear and then bearing. And I'll explain each of those in a little more detail in a moment. Or the loading of the bolt can be in tension, and obviously uh, we could have a case where there's combined, both features are present, it's combined tension and shear. So here's shear loading as a simple uh, truss connection. And uh, if you follow the loads through, what are we doing now, by the way, mentally? Think back to your second year mechanics of materials or engineering course. You draw free body diagrams. Oh, free body diagrams. I sure wish I'd spent more time on that. Well, that's one of the reasons why you should have spent more time on it. To get the internal forces that you need to design the fastener, you uh, draw free body diagrams so that you can elicit what, uh, let's say, the shear force in the fastener is. Now, I'm not going to be doing that. That's, that's the design process. But that second year course raises its ugly head from time to time. And you think, ah, free body diagrams. I'm grasping my brow here as I emphasize that. Uh, bolts loaded in tension. This would be the simplest example where uh, I've drawn a, a couple of these. They're f where you see those orangey bolts. There are four of those, two on the near side, two on the back side. Uh, and uh, if I draw a free body diagram at that location, how do I know which is the right free body diagram? The right free body diagram, and I'm not trying to be cute about it, is the one that gets you the answer that you need. And you don't know that in advance. So at this stage, it's trial and error. You're soon used to what's the right, what is the right free body diagram, so it's not that complicated. So there's the free body the free body diagram that I want to show is coming up next. Uh, those bolts are in shear. Those bolts are in tension. There's the free body diagram that I'm referring to. I want to deal with those four orange, orangey bolts. I have to therefore cut through those four orangey bolts. Draw a free body diagram, which is the one on the right hand side of the screen now. Use the equations of equilibrium, sum of forces in the vertical direction, gives us the force in those four bolts. I pause here. Is it, by the way, is it P over 4 for each of those bolts? The answer is no, unfortunately, for our, our life. Uh, here's the way that particular connection is deforming. And you think of, a, of yourself with a big uh, crowbar, you're prying up on that fastener that we want to examine. And if that T section that I'm using is flexible, they're all flexible to some degree, let's say particularly flexible, then I'll get a lot of extra force from that prying action. And uh, we have to be able to deal, that's a problem in analysis of our structure, but it's part and parcel of our fastener design too. So uh, I make a note here. We have very, very few problems in structural steel design where the bolts are, are the problem. The problems with bolting are, are largely one of interpretation. Party A is arguing with party B about something on installation. We can sort that out. It is sorted out in the various sources that I'm going to give you through the course of the presentation. Cases where we get into difficulty, though, are often where the bolts are nominally in tension, but there's also prying, so-called prying action, what I'm describing to you uh, right at, these, at this juncture. 
that can be a significant p over four it can be significantly higher than p over four like in the order of 20 percent so we can't ignore that we have to have a way of including it so i pointed out to you it's the case i repeat where we've gotten into physical problems the structure fell down the uh the Kemper arena in where is that kansas city down there somewhere uh why did that fail this was the kind of connection that the, that was in that structure it was more complicated than this and in passing and i probably say it somewhere else too all the material within the grip of the bolts in the joint in other words has to be steel for these rules and this behavior that we're describing the the material that we're dealing with has to be steel if it's not steel you can deal with it maybe you can maybe you can't maybe you give AISC a call they say don't do that if you say I really have to have it then you give me a call and you might work something out but this is not where you want to be and and this is so plain based on experience that the specification says you must not have anything within the grip of the steel that is not steel and in that arena I mentioned what was there that was not steel in, within the grip of the bolt? There was a, a resin impregnated fiber type thing sitting at this level. Who knows why it was there? Uh, that was is not steel, and that participated uh, in the failure that ultimately happened. Okay, I was on a, working my way through a list of bolts and shear, bolts and tension. Can we have bolts that are in combined tension and shear? Yeah. Look at this connection. Draw a free body diagram first that takes that inclined force in the bracing member, puts it into its components, horizontal and vertical, and we can always do that. And then we see clearly that the bolts that fasten the T to the flange of the I shape, they have to support both a horizontal force and a vertical force, some of the equations of equilibrium uh, and so that bolt you end up in that bolt with both components shear and tension and there are rules for that for uh, producing the strength of that situation I want to go back to the simplest joint here's and, and most of my examples are very simple and they're usually just plate structural plate features uh, I could draw a channel or a pair of angles or something like that but it doesn't affect how things behave, so we'll keep it simple. Okay, so we'll keep it simple uh, with this kind of a figure, and I'll draw my first free body diagram. I haven't quite finished it, but I draw uh, a, a cut, use a cut section just at the interface between these two plates. It has to be in equilibrium. Sum of forces in the horizontal direction has to be zero, so that means there has to be this force acting in that direction at that location. We call that a shear force. That's just a label. And if you wanted it in terms of stress, depends on whether you're using allowable stress design or ultimate strength design, you would divide that by area and you would get that representation. Well, let's carry on. All my examples or all my comments from here on are based on uh, LRFD. And uh, I should point out that I'm not short shortchanging you in any way connection design has always been on an ultimate strength basis even back in 1947 when Nancy who's sitting here with me was taking your undergraduate program uh, the, the rules may have said allowable stress design but they really were ultimate strength design the connection people were ahead of the other people primarily because there's no other way of uh, comfortably uh, accounting for it well, let's carry on with our figure. We draw a free body diagram of the bolt. We know there's a force P on it. Sum of forces in the horizontal direction has to be zero. So that means at the moment it's not in equilibrium. So there has to be another force pushing to the left in this example. And we, we label that a bearing force. The same force acts on the bolt in the same general sense. We like to label things. Uh, we call it, when it first appeared, at the top of the screen we call it shear force and at the bottom of this particular screen we call it same force we call it bearing force take it final step I'm going to do it pictorially now 
the force that we just identified pushes into the cylinder where the uh, that's formed the where the bolt's going to go. Uh, some of forces the one I've just drawn is equal and opposite to the bearing force. Some of forces in the horizontal direction takes me back to P over two, which is the are the forces in the the member. The member design I'm including is uh, on the basis of uh, tension, but it equally could be in terms of tension, compression. So we identified the force in the bolt, the shear force. We identified the force that the bolt imposed on the plate. That's a bearing force. And the force in the plate itself, which in my example is a tensile force. And then a uh, reminder that we're not finished yet. Force transfer could also be by friction. We've been doing it on the basis of the bolt will be in bearing, but transfer could also be uh, by friction, and that's something we'll come back to. So uh, first statement about the standard. Uh, we've gone quite a long way already, and that's it's the first time I've mentioned the specification, which I think is a good thing. So the AISC specification standard, specification you call it, sorry, uh, 2010. We have parallel LRFD and allowable stress design rules, and I just commented on that. Doesn't matter which where you came from, you're going to end up with the same bolt allowable stress design and uh, limits to LRFD. In one case, uh, LRFD uses a re so-called resistance factor, which is phi, and allowable stress design uses a horseshoe type thing. I, I didn't check what the Greek alphabet says there. By the way, uh, my Greek symbols for phi vary throughout the presentation. Uh, it was too heartbreaking to change them so that they were consistent, but phi is phi. Why do we have phi in there, or the chi symbol? Because we don't know everything. We don't know everything about the loads. There's some uncertainty. We don't know everything about the resistance. There's some uncertainty. That's why that's there. We don't want to be too cautious. So we've got the concrete people out there sniffing at our heels, but we want to be safe and have a reasonable uh, design result. So we're using, uh, as a starting point, factored loads for LRFD or non-factored loads for allowable stress design. It doesn't matter where you start. It's where you end up. And it's the same bolt. Now, specification says, uh, literally, uh, required strength in LRFD less than or equal to phi, the uncertainty thing, uh, times R sub n. And R sub n is what we're going to be doing from this point on in the talk. And a lava stress design statement says uh, the required strength uh, less than or equal to R sub n divided by this factor Q. You notice that R sub n appears in each of those. So it's the phi factors that change their location. Our job is to get the R sub n. That's what we're going to be doing from here on in. So whether I do it in a lava stress design or uh, load and resistance factor design makes no difference. Thank goodness for that, eh? So we'll set that uh, aside. Excuse yes. me, Jeff. Uh, before we yep. move on, uh, I wanted to, uh, we have a couple questions I would like you to address. Yes, sir. One question is, are A193 grade B7 bolts allowed in structural applications? Well, I'd have to check that. You want my answer right now? Yeah. I'd have to check that specification. Obviously, I don't have it in my head, but... Uh, it would be allowed, yeah. Uh, you just have to recognize that its strength level uh, is not the same as A325, and obviously your questioner understands that. So the answer is yes, but use the right numbers that go along with that bolt grade. Okay. And, and the other and one? The other question uh, has to do with uh, uh, nuts and... Is it acceptable to use A194 2H nuts? This questioner works in an environment where they want to limit the hardness of fasteners, and the A194 2H nuts meet this requirement. Yeah, I, I think they do, but I don't have that. Sorry, I don't, you've got to ask me questions to which I know the answer. I'd have to look that up to see what I think it does. And your questioner is welcome to contact me, and I'll, you know, I'll look it up. But I think the answer is yes. Uh, 
Okay, great. Thank you. And let me repeat that the bulk, the, the nut grade that goes along with the fastener, and I pointed this out earlier, uh, will develop the strength of the bolt that you're fastening. So we'd have to make sure that that's the case. We don't have to make sure. We just look at a table. Okay, we were starting on uh, uh, installation. And here's uh, somebody with a so-called spud wrench. Spud wrench is this all manual wrench, obviously. Uh, it's about 15 inches long. It's got the business head, which is what you see. It's got a pointy end, which you don't see. It's at the other end, which you can use for a lot of things like shoving through uh, uh, comp complementary uh, holes as you swing parts into place. And it's the starting point for installation. So a snug tight means I don't need any particular pretension. I need a certain level just to hold things together. We'll say more about that. Or if you need it pretensioned, when do we need it pretensioned? Still to come. Uh, we can do it in several different ways. One is so-called calibrated wrench. One is turn of nut. Other, and there are other means which are called tension control bolts and load indicator washers. We'll, we'll go through all of those. Before we do, I want to look at the big picture. I've been looking at small pieces. Here's a large joint. I think it was 24 bolts. And as we load this from zero, I happen to have this in uh, metric units. Don't worry about that. The pictures all look the same. Uh, initially, there's some load transfer by friction, whether it's a little or a lot. Here, it, it's a standard case, so we get quite a bit of frictional resistance. That's just the, the way the specimen was set up. But at some point, it slips, because the holes, are, of course, are bigger than the uh, fasteners themselves. So it slips so-called into bearing. It can be one slip, like I've shown, so-called major slip or it can be several small slips. It doesn't matter to us. It ends up at the same place. So below that level, load transfer is by friction, if we, if we have it. If it's zero, this just doesn't appear. And after that, it's bearing and shear uh, in combination. It remains, as we go from left to right, uh, pretty much linear, but starts to bend over as portions of the joint yield. And then it yields at some point on the net section, and at some point it yields on the gross section. So this is the drum rule here. This is the big picture. OK. So what are the issues? Well, the issues are things like, what's the shear strength of the bolt? Uh, it's either in single shear or double shear. You can contrive to have it in more than double shear, but that's uncommon. You would ask whether there are threads in the shear plane or not in the shear plane. So that we have to acknowledge those things. We have to look at the bearing capacity of, in principle, we have to look at the bearing capacity of the bolt, but that never governs. The bolts are always stronger in bearing than the material we're connecting. That's just the way things come together in the life of steel. So yes, in principle, to satisfy our equations of equilibrium, we have to do that, and we did that in the simple example that I covered earlier. And then we have to look at the bearing capacity of the plate. Yes, we'll do that. And then the capacity of the member, just to complete the circle, in tension, which is my drawings tend to be, or in compression if it's the other way around. So if it's slip, on the other hand, slip can be as much as two hole clearances. Is that a little or a lot? Well, it's not very much. It's about, I don't know, two dimes, something. Two dimes thick, something like that. Moreover, some bolts will already being bearing, be in bearing at the, you know, some are on the left-hand side of the holes and some are on the right, some are in the middle. We don't know where that ends up. But on average, the amount of both based on tests uh, and on, uh, more importantly, on field measurements, slip is more like a half a hole clearance. So we're down now to one dime or less. And you have to ask yourself, People tend to def default to the most conservative solution. That's just the way we are. If you don't need it, don't specify it. If you don't need a joint that, has, that is slip-proof, then don't pay for it. 
costs you more money to put it in, costs more money to inspect, and so on. So if this half-hole clearance is okay, which it would be for most steel buildings, for example, uh, then don't ask for a bearing type connection. So in the shear type connection, the specifications include information for both of these cases, bearing type or slip critical. Okay, the bearing type. The issues are, this is really a review of things I've already said. The bolt shear strength, the capacity of the connected material, and then the member strength. I include that in the list. It's not what we're going to do this afternoon primarily, though. Now, this statement, shear strength of bolts is not dependent on the presence or absence of pretension. And this is the first statement that we've had in this 30 minutes that we've covered so far that's not apparent or logical or intuitive. How come if I pretension the bolts, what does he mean by pretension? I better slip that in here. So you're turning the nut on to the fastener, connecting some material. You're turning the nut on, and when you turn the nut on, you're progressing down the helix, which is the threads, which means you're elongating the bolt. And the bolt says, I don't like that so much. I've got to resist that. So that's, what, that's the pretension. The pretension is the bolt saying, uh, maybe I need that, but I'm not too happy with it. Tell me more. Okay. It's a lot dependent. So people sitting on the right-hand side of the audience uh, say, uh, I'm not going to pretension my bolts. And the people sitting on the left-hand side of the audience say, I'm going to pretension the bolts. And they're both bearing type connections. Uh, are they different? I'm, I'm telling you, and I'm going to illustrate a little more, that those who pretensioned and those who didn't pretension were going to get the same answer. It didn't, the ultimate shear strength doesn't depend on whether we pretension it or not. So that's, that's kind of important. It's not kind of important. It is important. So there's that little picture. I'm, I'm proceeding, continuing on now with uh, uh, bearing type connections. So bolts and bearing type connections, that was the big picture, and there's the region we're looking at. Why did I pick this one? Well, I picked this one first just because one of them has to be first. But this region of bearing type behavior is where we usually should end up. In buildings, this is where you should end up. The notable exception would be seismic stuff, and I'll cover that off a little bit later. Uh, so th that's, where, that's where we would be. That's the bolt and the bearing type connection. So the bolt shear strength, I'm going to make the statement and then show you the figure and other stuff in a moment, is about 62% of the bolt's ultimate tensile strength. I said to you at the beginning, and you've forgotten it already, how can I ever get anywhere? The bolt shear strength comes from the mechanics of material, strength of material, uh, second year usually, uh, mechanics of material course, where there are something called theories of failure. Oh, yeah, I come back. Theories of, one of the theories of failure says use the von Mises yield criteria. Well, maybe you don't remember the name, but the von Mises yield criteria says that the relationship between tension and shear for steel is about 1 over the square root of 3. I've got a little audience here, and they're, they're making money, pocket money, by giving the right answers. It's 1 over the square root of 3, and the square root of 3 is 0.577, and point one over, that's 57%. Eh? That's the theory. The theory says it should be 50, actually 58%. The tests show a little higher than that, but not seriously. So that relationship, which earlier on I said we needed the relationship between the acceptance test, the bold intention, and its behavior, in this case, in shear. And that relationship is 62%. The design rule uh, takes 90% of that value. I, I asked this question earlier, why? Because we don't know everything. We don't know everything about the loads. We don't know, but 90% is, is the number. We take 90%. That's a high value. In other words, we've got a, a good product. Then we ask, are there threads in the shear plane? And then there's another thing coming along in a moment called the long join effect. So we need another uh, discount factor. So there's the test for a bolt and shear. You say, well, that's not that complicated. We could do that, couldn't we? Yeah, we can. That's not a hard test to do. So here are, uh, here's the test. 
I'll, I'll show you the actual figure in a moment, but this is a real test. Look at the A325 bolt. For a lot of money, for a big purse, you're going to write the design rule. What are you going to write as the basis for the design rule? Well, is it elastic? Is there a region where it's elastic? Look at A490 bolts. You could argue, not successfully with me, that in the early region between 0 and 20 or maybe 0 and 40, it's linear. Well, sort of, but not really. And it's not much of a benchmark. The only logical level of load at which, which to use for design purposes would be ultimate. It just cries out for that. Use the, use the ultimate load level in shear for the design rule. And that's what we do, and that's what we've been doing as I've tried to encourage you over these years. Well, there it is. Uh, we learn so much from looking at real failures. This is a real failure. So there's the bolt with 78th inch diameter. You see on the left-hand side the nut turned on there. You see the washer snuggled in there. Uh, you see the head at the other end. This test was taken to the point just before shear failure and then stopped and then sawn apart so we could bring it to you live and kicking. Okay, they're one inch uh, thick plates. I mentioned that, 78th inch bolt diameter, four plates. What else can I get? Can you see the, can you see the bearing stresses? Can you see the shear stresses? So anytime there's a pause after I make some statement like that, the answer is not the obvious one. Uh, can you see, let me repeat the question. Can you see the bearing stresses? Can you see the shear stresses? The answer is no, you can't see stresses. It's just, that's the physical reality, you can't see stresses. But what are we seeing? We're seeing deformations. We teach this all backwards. We should teach uh, deformations first and then the resultant forces or loads that respond to that. So having gotten out of that way, that out of the way, we ask the question again, can you see the bearing deformations? Look on the right-hand ply, on the left-hand ply, yeah, it's pretty clear. This should be uh, symmetrical left to right. It isn't quite. quite. Uh, and then uh, the two plates in the middle at the top side, you can see the bearing deformations. Likewise with the shear, look at the, let's look on, just on the right-hand side. Can you see the shear deformations? Yeah, they're humongous. Steel is such a wonderful ductile material. It's such a wonderful material, and one of the reasons, primarily, primary reasons, is it's so ductile. Here are uh, four bolts. It's a bigger, the joint I just showed you is one bolt. Let's move to, these were uh, 13 bolts in line, of which uh, just the top four are showing. So look at the top bolt, then down one, and then down two, and then down three, and then it goes on. And what difference do you notice? What's different between, let's say, the top one and the bottom one on my figure? Well, the amount of shear deformation is quite different, isn't it? So if I have 13 bolts in line, can I take the total load and divide by 13 to get the load per bolt? Well, I can do it, but I wouldn't be right. Uh, Think of deformations. The one at the top is deformed a lot. The one four bolts down has got sufficient ductility in shear deformations, but it's not as much as the one at the top. In other words, the one at the top has more shear force than the one four down or five down or six down. So we have to be able to account for this. Let me repeat the question and the answer. Can I divide by... If I have one bolt, it carries 100% of the load. If I have two bolts, they each carry 50%. If I have three bolts, they don't carry each a third. And so on, four or five. But uh, we'll see more of that. that. That example, by the way, is a, kind of an extreme case. It's extreme so that it could be shown to uh, people like you so you get an appreciation for the amount of shear deformation. All right. I'll repeat this, I already said it. The bolt pretension comes from the small axial deformations that we put in there on the bolt as the nut is turned on. They're small, but they are relieved as the shear deformations take place. Shear yielding softens that location. I'm gonna show you that. 
both the tension, both tension test measurements and shear strength tests show that. And it tells you that the, that tells us that the bolt shear strength is not dependent on the pretension in the bolt. My statement of a few images ago, uh, whether I pretensioned them or didn't pretension them, I get the same answer. And that's true to a remarkable degree. So I'll show the figure again. First of all, we said that the shear tension relationship is a 1 over the square root of 3 approximately. We use 0.62. Uh, so the shear strength of the single bolt is 0.62 of the ultimate tensile strength of the bolt. Now let's look at the amount of shear deformation that goes along with that. Obviously, I'm just putting this on the, uh, by hand, by, by judgment, putting it on. But it's a lot of deformation. A bolt in shear is very ductile. Good thing? Yeah, really good. OK, when you do that, you get, I'm going to flip back and forth on this so you can see it again. So there's a zone, kind of an egg-shaped zone. It has to plastify in there. And that plastification, let me go back again, that amount of shear deformation reflects plastification in that zone. And once you plastified that zone, it doesn't fall apart, but it says all the effort that I put into pretensioning that bolt has dissipated virtually to zero. That is the backup for the statement that says whether the bolt was pretensioned or not pretensioned, I get the same ultimate shear strength. So finally, the design rule. Uh, I said we're going to be calculating the R sub N. Uh, the fee factor, we already discussed that with you. So we, we, we obtain that from something called FNV and area bolt. Area bolt will be the cross-sectional area. We have to figure out what the FNV is. I would expect it to be something like, well, 0.6 something. Eh? So that's called the design shear strength, and that's called the nominal shear strength. So it's the nominal shear strength that we'll explore, and that's the 0 0.62. 0 0.62, I said, comes from experimental results. The 90%, I've told you why we need to throw that in. We don't know everything about the loads. We don't know everything about the resistance. So what, we, what we're going to use is 62% of F sub U, 90%, I've just explained that, and the number then is 0 0.563. The stuff from here back, you never see. You as a user, as a student, as a researcher, you tend to not see that. What I've been trying to do is to get you to see that. OK, now you see it, and you go to a table. I think I've got it on the next slide. Yeah, uh, which says, oh, the, pi, the point five six three. the people who write the, specific, the handbook, the manual, they, they haven't got time and space to put all this preliminary stuff in. But I think it's important for your good of your engineering soul that you know it and you have it. So the 563, now you know where it comes from. Yeah. For example, an A325 bolt, if there are no threads in the shear plane, it happens to be a, a, a group A, and there's a tabulated value uh, uh, in J3.2. And so you, you work it out, and the tabulated value is 68 KSI. You're seeing the 68, and I'm trying to move you back mentally in time to say, where did it come from? I have to know where that came from. It's, I have to know that. It's not complicated. Now, if you have threads in the shear plane, we just don't have as much area if we don't have threads in the shear plane. And that's about 80, that ratio is about 80%. just comes from tests. Uh, that, uh, whoops. Sorry, just give me a minute here. It's supposed to go back. Well, I better not spend too much time on that. OK, for threads included, the tabulated values are 80% of, of the above. OK, we'll accept that. And some comments then. Uh, the discount for length, I, I mentioned that the length of the joint affects how the bolts are loaded. Uh, your, specif your specification uses, that's the 90% primarily. That's the 90%. That's con if you're uneasy about that, 
don't be. It's conservative. It's already conservative. There's some backroom stuff going on here that says you're using 90%. Uh, that's fine. That's lots. That's cons it's already conservative. Now, if the joint length, however, the joint is longer and longer and longer in this scenario, and at about 38 inches, you give up and say, I can't say they're equal. I have to throw another factor in there. And that other factor is a further reduction of 83%. So that's like my joint with, I showed four bolts out of 13. That's this case here. So we do have to account for it at a certain point. And the fee value, which I haven't mentioned, uh, I've mentioned it in principle, but here we're using it, is 0.75, and it's also conservative. We're getting there. Just shortly before my death, the specification will be right where I want it, and all the numbers will line up and with the phases of the moon. Okay, but we work away at it. We don't want to be careless about things. So specification writers do things uh, incrementally, and that's as it should be. Uh, unfortunately, and I do this job where I live too, we tend to make things more complicated all the time. And getting to that age where I say, keep it simple, keep it simple. Well, I'll say, keep it simpler. Okay, let's return to, to uh, structures and the slip critical. So this, uh, I think this is a power plant somewhere in the U.S., we see these areas where uh, it's not painted. Presumably, that would be to uh, provide slip resistance around the joint. So that's what we're talking about. So there it is in simple form. No, no matter how busy it gets, the previous image, uh, the, uh, the uh, simple form is fully representative. I've got the pretension. We still have to find out more about the pretension. What is it? How do I get it? How do I inspect for it? Uh, and, uh, but we have to write a rule first. And uh, we can have the frictional resistance at the interface. We've got the force in the member, and we've got the pretension. I think I already said that. There's, not, there's nothing else. So the load at which slip takes place, is it a function of all that stuff? Well, I can't spend too much time jogging your memory. No, it's not. Slip, do you remember the, the wooden block on the inclined plane? That's back in high school physics now. And one of the things you did with that little experiment was to show that the slip load of the block on the inclined plane was independent of the contact area. It doesn't matter what the contact area is. So we don't have to know what the con... We don't... It's not relevant. Is this important? Yeah, it is. Your inspector comes back from the field and you say, how's everything going? And he, of course he says, yeah, it's going pretty well. But there's always a but. He says... On some of those big joints, I can see through the ply. They're not fully in contact uh, throughout the length of the joint. And what do you say? Well, you give them time to sweat for a little bit because you want them to sh realize how clever you are. And you say, well, you know, in the final analysis, it's independent of the contact area. We don't want to get sloppy about this, so I'm not advocating that you can have lots of clearance in there. You can't. But it's... It's got to be in contact in some places. As long as it's in contact in some places, the joint is perfectly fine. So you send that inspector back to the field happy. So it's a function of the slip coefficient and the, uh, I'll go back to the figure, the slip coefficient and the pretension. Okay, back to that big picture. We're down in this. This is the region we're starting into now, that slip critical behavior. When do we need them? If you have a repetitive load and changes go from tension to compression, you could get fretting by fatigue. I'll show you that in a moment. If, the cha if there's a change in geometry, so your two, slip of, your two hole clearances slip in a high-rise building, is that going to change your life? Well, there are some cases that, that it will, but mostly it won't. Certain other cases, uh, slip Certain other cases really come bring us back to bridges. Uh, bridges, if, we, if it slips, no matter how much it slips, my hands are in the air and I'm going back and forth, back and forth a little bit. I'll show you a figure. Uh, slip critical joints are necessary for uh, joints where that repetition occurs. For buildings, for example, 
we don't care if it goes back and forth a few times. These seismic rules are different. So there's a hole in a plate. You see the crack. You see the scratch marks. Uh, this was a test fixture, so there were a lot of scratches on it. And from that region in the upper third of the image, uh, a crack started. The crack didn't start at the hole. The hole of that diameter is very forgiving. Uh, it started at the surface. These scratches that I'm pointing out to you, that's where it started. So if your inspector comes back to you and he said, how, and you say, how is everything? And he says, it's all right, but. And he says, but, you know, they've nicked the edge of that member in the bridge or they've uh, not finished the edges properly and so on. These are issues relating to fatigue. And you have to, these are not forgivable. These you have to be on top of. Okay, back to the issue. From first principles, the slip resistance is the product of uh, the slip coefficient, it's bare steel, 0.3 would be a typical value. The number of bolts in this summation side sign is the uh, pretension of one bolt, and we have to get it for all bolts. Sorry, N is the number of slip planes, usually one or two. So there's the design uh, slip resistance in your specification. Looks kind of busy, but it comes, thank goodness, it comes very closely to the, comes very close to the fundamentals. There's the clamping force. There's the number of slip planes. There's the slip coefficient. And the rest we'll put on the second image. So those terms, H sub F and D sub U, need to be defined. And we have to put in, generally I'm not putting the fee values in, just to keep things a little cleaner. So there's a modifier that says, uh, uh, has to do with the fills. If, if you've got a big joint and you've got a lot of fills, so it's a big bridge or a big building, uh, the, there's a filler factor which time doesn't permit us going into, which is either 1 or 0.85. And then it says, do you have, are you using standard holes or oversized or long slotted in these various uh, prescriptions? So if it's a standard hole, you just use 1. If it's a long slotted hole, you use 0.7 just to pick 2. You know, why the difference? If it's long slotted and it slips, you'll get a lot of slip. So the fee factor has that the fee factor is accounting for that. So you use that's why you're using 0.7. There's a lot of recent work in this area, and you'll find if you're a user in this area of big members and slip, uh, there are significant changes, additions, elaborations in the current 2010 specification. The 1.13 is given as uh, the ratio of installed bolt, bolt tension to specified minimum. I've never, I haven't told you yet what specified minimum is, but trust me, it's coming. So this is the difference between what you got and what you asked for, and that's you get a 13% bonus. Uh, not really true, but I'll comment on that in a minute. Uh, can't do every option, but for clean mill scale, uh, that number for slip is 0.3. For uh, unplanted, unpainted and blast cleaned is 0.5. The one I caution you a little bit about here is the hot dip galvanized. It, it gets 0.3, and we're uncertain. We're not convinced that it is 0.3. There's work going on on that now. Um, all I'd say to you at this point is that if you're using hot dip galvanized and roughest surfaces, uh, spend a little more time with it because it may or may not be 0.3. And it's, uh, it's, I'm sorry to be vague on it, but, but I am encouraging you to get the, the uh, recent research. And I've got a, a slide in here for so-called advanced readers, and I think I'll leave that for advanced readers uh, if you feel you're in that category. Okay, I've got to move on. Bolts and tension. There's the free body diagram. Uh, what's the capacity? Bolt and tension is a product of the tensile strength of the bolt and the tensile stress area of the bolt. What's the tensile stress? What does he mean? He, this is a little tension member in the upper right-hand corner. What's the least cross-sectional area? Well, it's through the threads, sort of. It's not exact. Thread is a helix. It's not a circum circumferential. So it's not quite at the roots. And that's what they're accounting for here. 
It's not as severe as through the root of the threads. It's a little better than that. And that'll show up uh, in a moment. So we want the product of S sub U of the bolt and the tensile stress area shown on this figure as A sub S T. Uh, and that'll show up directly in a moment. Just a reminder that the force, which we're not generally calculating here, I'm just reminding you that, that if it's a bolt in tension, uh, you've got to be sure in your calculations about uh, prying action. One standard that does it differently, which I think is good, calculating that prying action force, Kemper Arena stuff that I gave you 20 minutes ago, the British standard says, ah, oh, heck with it. Uh, we'll just have everybody throw on another 20%. So I, that'll get, I think that's not a bad way of doing it. Uh, and, and that'll tell you at least a starting point that 20% uh, would be kind of an upside figure. So some comments. I would avoid uh, joints that put my personal preference. I would avoid, avoid the case where we put bolts into tension, especially if you have fatigue. Really can't stress that too much. I would a little bit prefer A325 bolts rather than A490s. They're a little more duct. They're both ductile. The A325 is more ductile. I wouldn't get all hot and sweaty, though, if I had to use 490s, but really minimize the prying action. That's important. Pretension bolts in a connection. The question, if we now we apply external force to the connection, we've got an internal force. We're not quite there with the, may as well tell you what the internal force is. How much are you required to, to what load level are you required to uh, pretension the bolt? You have a little idea of how to do it. I haven't given you a figure. Well, that figure is uh, 70%. So the pretension you must put in is 70% of the bolt ultimate tensile strength. All right. Then we add the external forces on the connection. Maybe the two add. That's the last question on this image. So we pretension this, follow this through. We're not going to do it in detail. The answer is no. They don't. The answer is yes, they do add, but not badly. So let me step through it. So you pre-tension the bolt. You got tension in the bolts, compression in the plates. You add external tension forces on the connection, and the bolt tension increases logically, and the compression between the plates decreases. We examine equilibrium and compatibility, and uh, uh, find that, as I just said, the bolt force. Yes, it does increase, but only by about seven percent. So that's buried in the rule. We don't worry more about it. So finally, the rule then can be this, this area times the tabulated, we'll have to find out where that comes from, F sub NT strength. So that's the design tensile strength. That's the nominal. That's what we want. And that's the bolt area for the nominal. The nominal that's pi D squared over 4. But it's not pi D squared over 4, is it? It's less than that. It's sort of through the roots, but not, not exactly. And the sort of, not exactly, is 0.75. On the right-hand side of the uh, uh, figure that's being shown now, it's about 75% of the area of the pi d squared over 4 area. So that's what we use. We adjust the area. So P ultimate is 75 F sub U area bolt. And that we call, and that you tabulate it in your, Manual is F sub NT. So it looks like somebody's saying, uh, there's, there's your rule, which follows directly from the specification. Uh, it says 75% F sub U, and somebody comes along and says, hey, you're only using 75% of F sub U. We're not. We're using 75% of a, of a semi-fictitious area. Logically, we place it next to the 0.75. Well, there's something else you know and your friends don't know. Okay, we still have to deal with the bearing capacity. That's the action going back in there. And uh, what's happening is the shear out of a block of material or yielding. We'll treat them as separate. They're probably some combination of the two. So there with the background uh, information, which I don't need to describe verbally, we need these two rules. One is it's shearing out of material, 
or if that doesn't happen, it's yielding. And there's so much yielding that we have to put a stop on it. So the shear load is the shear area times the shear ultimate stress. That's the tau ultimate times a certain length times the thickness. There are two of those areas. You go back and look at the figure. And so we write the rule and look at it uh, in, as it is in your specification, uh, except I don't have a fee factor in it yet. So the 1.5 comes directly from what's above, 2 times 0.75, and then the geometry. So it's, it's empirical, no, problem, no question. Uh, to complete it, it's based on uh, a relationship between the uh, plate strength material and the bearing strength material, and we'll leave that for your perusal. It's followed up to three diameters. So we make that substitution and it end up with three diameters T F sub U. Now, if that doesn't all just flow through your head at the moment, uh, leave it for later because it's just arithmetic. And finally, your rule says, the one, I'm looking for the 1.5 and I see it, but less than three uh, bolt diameters times some other stuff. Still with the fee factor to, to come in. When deform However, it carries on and says, when deformation is a consideration, use something else. And the something else is 80% of what we just completed. How come? Now, that's, that's not very logical either. It's not, not at all logical, but how come? And, and one is uh, deformation of consideration. Uh, it comes down to personal evaluations. I would almost never use this, but most people use this all the time because it's the lower one. Uh, so if you say to your, look at your structure and say it's a 50-story building and I don't want it to drift very much, then you might use this one. Back to, uh, this is a, a semi-new topic. So this is a gusset plate, obviously. Uh, it's one that was tested, and uh, the 45-degree lines that in white are just there to see what how, what happened. Uh, it stiffened a little bit at the edges, and let me tell you that this is oh, and the uh, I got to point to things. The two dark there's a dark line to the left and a dark line to the right. That's just where the other plate there was a plate slapped on the front side of this and a plate on the back side. They'd been taken off, and that's where they were. So that, that vertical line there. And I'm, I'm going to tell you that this is at the point of ultimate load. If you can tell me the mechanism here, we can provide the design rule. Oh, he says, it's at ultimate. Do you see, do you see something broken? Well, my, my crowd here in the office is thinking hard, but we'll put them out of their misery and say, yeah, down there, do you see that now, that little ligament there? That's failed. That's failure. And that's the, that we'd, we'd find that the load that causes that, and we'd find the load that's carried in the vertical sense, and there's our answer. It's not complicated, but boy, we've sure made it complicated in the past. And that block of material then shears out. It shears out up those two sides and across the bottom. Steel is very ductile, as I keep pounding into your heads, but it's not infinitely ductile. It's very ductile in shear. And it's not so ductile in tension. So it's the tension stuff that gives up first. And that's what you're seeing here. So you write the rule for that. And you say, oh, shear yield along the vertical surfaces. And it doesn't go through the holes, you notice. If, if you're close enough and your image is good enough, you'll see uh, yield lines just to the left and to the right of those five bolts on each side. Uh, shear yield along the vertical planes and tension fracture along the, the little horizontal plane. You can almost neglect that. In this example, you can almost neglect that. So for big prize money, I say write the rule. And you go away and you think about it and you say, oh, it's, it's got to be at least this with some fee factors. It's the net area intention times F sub U. And then what's shear yield? Uh, approximately, the relationship between shear and tension is about 0.6 in yield too. 
So 0 0.6 times the gross area in shear times Fy, because it's yielding, not fracture. It's, it's dead simple. Of course, we're going to make it look more complicated. But So tension fracture plus shear yield, and you're home free. There's some other stuff going on. I'll just show you one more example. That's for a cope beam where obviously the eccentricity has to come into play. And I said, it, I said on one of the previous images that it doesn't fail through the holes. This would appear to say it failed through the holes. These tests, they hap the fracture happens so quickly you can't stop it. So uh, it was through the hole. And then when the final separation occurred, it jumped over to the hole. So you just have to trust me on that. So you'd have to modify that equation a little bit to include uh, an allowance for the eccentricity. Got to install these. There's a man with an uh, impact wrench, bearing type connection. We're going to install the bolts. Bolts can be install, uh, installed to snug tight only. What's snug tight? It's the ordinary effort of a worker using a spud wrench. I pointed out to you what a spud wrench is. Will we get some pretension? Yes, but we don't know what it is. It's not very. This is snug tight only. It's not very very large. So to repeat what I said earlier, you're bringing the parts together, you're elongating the bolt in tension as you turn the nut on, and that's the pretension that we've been talking about. Now, there's another way of doing it, and that's to take a calibrated wrench, and it's based on somebody looking at a mechanical engineering handbook saying, oh yeah, I, I know the relationship between the elongation of that fastener as we roll up the, on the threads the relationship on a theoretical basis is badly out of whack. I mean, it just doesn't work. It's, it's about 40% off. So don't take a handbook. You must not take a handbook value. It's so important that specification, RCSC, which I mentioned to you, and I'll give you the source, says that's so bad, we're, not, we're going to set it out as you can't do it. We don't often do that in specification, but we do here. You can't do it that way. However, if you calibrate that impact wrench, you can do it that way. Then that's still a way of doing it. What's an impact wrench? Well, there it is. And that's a, a piece of hydraulic equipment that's squeezing together. It's calibrated so that that dial will read what the force is as you turn the nut on. And uh, you adjust the wrench to stall or cut out at the desired level of bolt pretension. And I've already mentioned that the desired pretension is 70% of the bolt ultimate tensile strength. You have to get at least there. The target value is 5% over that because you're doing it as a calibration. You have to do it on at least three bolts. If you're doing it this way, you have to do it on at least three bolts. It's unique to those bolts. If you're installing four-inch long bolts this morning and six-inch long bolts this afternoon, you have to do another calibration. That's just uh, that's mandatory. Then you have to use washers. So if it's turn of and if it's turn of nut, which I haven't mentioned yet, you say run it run it down, bring the parts in close contact. Good. This is all good housekeeping. Work from stiff region, regions to the edge. Snug tight is the first impact of the guy on that impact wrench, or the full effort of a person on a spud wrench, and then apply, apply an additional what? It's either one-third, two-thirds, or a half. A half, depending on the length of the bolt. A half is the usual case. So I'll just carry on with describing it based on a half. So these iron workers, they've been around. They earn more salary than you do. And they say, gee, that sounds awfully vague to me. Well, they use their own words. Here's the result. Here's, the again, the big picture, the bolt tension and bolt elongation by when ha we turn the nut on. And there's the specified value. The number happens to be 39. So we'll, we'll elaborate on this a little bit. OK, uh, these are 24 bolts. And the orangey stuff down there at the bottom is a histogram. Just look left to right. There's one bolt ended up at about, what, 0 0.03 of elongation. And then two at point oh, I don't know four, and then a space and blah 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 till we've accounted for all 24. There's also on this figure the information that says when we install these bolts, some of them by sorry snug tight. We're going to we're going to let me back up. 
snug tight and then a half turn. We've got snug tight and half turn both on this figure. Okay, the purple lines are what happened that snug. So you look at it and say, gosh, uh, one of these is about 15 hips and the other is about, uh, it's about 39. That's a, that's a big spread. So you're going to tell me something more about that. Okay, I'm going to tell you something more about that. So we'll take that off and say there's the, we can measure these elongations. It's not a practical thing for you to do, but we, it can be done. So the least elongated bolt is 0.03, I'll call it, and the most elongated bolt is I don't know, 0 0.5, 0 0.05. And we find the loads by, look up at the top, image, top part of the image now. There's the least elongated. What's the load in it? 50. What's the most elongated? What's the load in it? Gee, I don't know. 49, 51. They're very close. How come they're close? Because you yielded the bolts. You intentionally, let me say it differently. Intentionally, you put the bolts into the yielded portion of the stress strain curve of the bolt. Is it a problem? Is the structure going to fall down? No. Perfect. This is, this is a simple, accurate method uh, and should be used if you want to use it. If you think you're going to determine bolt preloads after installation, yeah, it can be done, but it's not practical. Understand whether you need, lots of people put in pretension bolts and they never needed them. Stay on, be sure you're on the site. This is not an office job. Uh, monitor the installation. Are they doing things properly and are they storing the bolts properly? Meaning uh, deterioration like rust. Uh, an inspection just follows that. If bolt tension is required, it wasn't required, don't inspect for it. Same response, sometimes they, you, inspect, you find they're inspecting for it and they never needed it in the first place. Okay, know what the calibration process is and make sure they're doing that. And work, work in progress should be observed. So AISC says they need to be snug, these are different categories, need to be snug tight only or they are pretension, but it's not slip critical. I don't care if it's slip critical, or it's slip critical, the whole ball of wax. So the inspection goes along with those categories. So snug tight only, it just has, has to be bearing tight. If the bolts are in tension, um, A through 25s only are permitted uh, bolts in tension. Uh, when there's no fatigue or vibration, which means the bolt could, vi the nut could vibrate. Let me back up. If, the, if you install the bolt and you're sure you got it up to the 70% value at least and you didn't break it, obviously you'd know if you broke it, then the chances are highly likely that it's a satisfactory installation. Now, you won't find that written down in the specification, but I'm telling you that. There are lots of test results, and we know that to be the case. So for snug tight, I'm going to jump through this reasonably quickly because it just says do the right things. Uh, got the right stuff? This is what the first bullet says. Yeah. Got the right holes? Yeah, got the right holes. I mean, why do we need to make a list? It's common sense. Reasonably clean. They don't have to be sparkling clean. And they're in close contact after the bolts are snugged. I mentioned this earlier. Uh, they should be in close contact. We don't want places for corrosion to get started. So they're good reasons why we should have them in close contact. But the world doesn't end if they're not fully in contact throughout the length of the member of the joint. And all material, stress this one up and down and sideways, all material has to be steel in the grip of the bolt. Now finally, I think it's finally, no, not quite. If it's pretensioned, uh, Pretension uh, bolts are required, then all of the above plus some more. So that they do the right things. I've got these in the list, but there's no point in uh, spending time on them. So for slip critical, all of the above, and uh, make sure that what they're doing in the field is the same as the uh, 
applied in the calibration process. So there's a, a big joint. It's been marked up, you notice, with chalk. Do you need to do that? You don't need to do that. It's, uh, it's good bookkeeping, and some people do it that way. Uh, and on jobs where you do it that way, you probably don't have to stand there watching the bolt installation once you're satisfied. If they're not doing that, which is obviously a cost in manpower, then you have to be there to a reasonable level. Some comments. Your inspector comes back and he, he says, this is so common, I think they over-tighten some bolts. You can't over-tighten bolts. If you've over-tightened them, you break them. Uh, if it's greater than specified minimum value, not, not a problem. It's, uh, this is new information, I think, for most of us. Uh, there's a rotation test, particularly the short bolt. Short bolt, let's say a 78th inch diameter, A325 or A490 bolt, and it's only two inches long. Often those will get twisted off before the installation's complete. Uh, and that's because you don't have enough, let's say it's galvanized, you don't have enough ductility there. And uh, so this re may require special attention. If your report from the field comes back, they're breaking bolts, they're breaking bolts. This is the first place to look. There's a histogram. We did this for three. We found actual bolt pretensions for three uh, different bridges, A325 bolts. And uh, uh, you can see that most of them fall well within the usual limits, but there's some over there on the left-hand side that are below. They have to be at least one. Uh, to meet this test. The average is 1.27, you'll see, but some are down here at 0.6. Do we care? Well, I would, I would say yes, we care, but do we care enough to start tightening bolts during the job and so on? Out of 160 bolts, let's say about 12 don't make it. Would you, that wouldn't concern me. Out of 160 bolts, that wouldn't concern me. 12 don't make it. However, there's a level at which it would concern me, so it's, there's no unique answer. Uh, notice that for uh, HG25 bolts turn of nut, they're about 18% stronger in material, and the average pretension force, instead of being 0.70%, is 80%. So you get more than you bargained for. That's 38% more than the minimums. And for A490 bolts, you get about 26%. But those numbers, those, ad, those advantages, they're already buried in the rule somewhere. So it's nice to have, uh, but we have to be aware that it's already accommodated. These are the other two categories. They're, the ASTM designations are now F. This is uh, tension control, and the other one will be... Uh, 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 a, a deformation control. So it's a, uh, a different kind of bolt. You'll notice the business end has a different appearance. Uh, there's a special wrench that's used that fits over the nut and the spline simultaneously. There's a groove there, and at a pres prescribed level, sorry, at a prescribed level, that'll twist off. So if you've calibrated it to twist off at the prescribed level of pretension, then that's a, that will be a satisfactory installation. The fact that you've twisted off the tips is not in itself satis. You've got all those tips, so what? You've got to have the pretension. So you've got to uh, recognize that inadvertently Friction conditions can be very high, in which case you'll twist it off almost immediately. And likewise, friction conditions can be very low, and you'll never twist it off in those extreme cases. So calibration uh, is essential. Advantages of this type of fastener are insulations from one side. It's an electric wrench. That's advantageous. Uh, insulation is quiet. It's more expensive, however, and you have to do this calibration. Direct tension indicators are another way of approaching that. This one's pretty much self-explanatory. This special washer is used, and as you put that into the system and pre-tension the bolt, it squeezes those bumps, and 
if you calibrate when those bumps have closed to a desired value, then it'll be satisfactory. And uh, it is. And those are both reliable. I'm flipping through some screens here. Those are both uh, reliable methods as long as you follow the rules. They're used, it seems to me, preferentially. Some parts of the country they use them. Other parts of the country they use turn and nut. So some details for seismic connections. Of course, you're going to analyze the structure. You compute the forces using whatever set of rules, AISC seismic design spec, for example. And now you design it. Now you're at the connection. So mostly, the stuff that we've talked about fits. Just because it's seismic, you've, you've checked the forces, used those forces, you know what they are. Uh, you would use a pre-qualified connection. And I've drawn it simply, but that's a pre-qualified. Pre Why would you go off on your own? Uh, and there's the kind of connection. These were uh, tension control bolts. So you see that, notice that the head looks different than the heads we've been looking at. So it's an all bolted connection. They're kind of coming back into style. Uh, so in seismic design, first of all, all the bolts have to be pre-tensioned. The fanging surfaces have to be like slip critical ones. Uh, you use the bearing values for the bolts. And the philosophy is that in moderate earthquakes, there will be no slip. Whereas in major earthquakes, slip will be allowed and the bolts, you'll let the bolts go into bearing. So you accept a little, you accept a small amount of damage, but hope that the big amount of damage, your structure will still be serviceable. So that's the idea. So in this approach, you've got a little bit of, uh, there's some other requirements which you can look at. You've got some slip critical requirements and some bearing requirements in the same set of rules. And they also require uh, something, statements about non-ductile limit state. Uh, if, if you have a non-ductile limit state in either member or connection, that must not be the governing one. And you use that rule for uh, bearing strength, that is the 2.4 and stuff, rather than the 3.0 and stuff. So that's, that's not the end, but it's kind of a break. Not a break, get up and wave your arms, because we still got something to go. So it all started with rivets. I haven't said anything about rivets until now. I'll point out in passing that if you're evaluating an existing structure, like a railway bridge, uh, and have to deal with uh, rivets, there's quite a lot of information there. We're not obviously going to take the time to go into it, but there's good information for all that stuff. Now. What we're going to do in the next six minutes, and I generally do it this way, although I'm a little behind, uh, is to go through an example, and it'll go very fast. And that's not unintended, but it's all stuff that we've done now in the first hour and a half, approximately. So it's a review. So you'll come back and say, oh, how did he do that? Cal how do I do that calculation? So I hope that calculation will show up for you, will show up here. So it's a gusset plate. There are the dimensions. Uh, it's actually one that was tested. And the forces are either, they're at 30 degrees. They're going either out or in. And either we know the bolt property. We know the material properties because some of them were tested. And if they weren't, we took specified values. So what are the issues? If, the brace, if that brace force is in tension, we would deal with slip load. We'd say no slip at service loads, shear load, bearing capacity of the plate, lock shear. Yeah, we, we discussed all those. If the force is in the other direction, slip load, yeah, but we've already checked it. Shear load of the bolts, yes, but we've already checked it. Bearing capacity of the plate, yes, but we've already checked it. Block shear, that doesn't apply. Pulling out, block shear happens. Pushing in, block shear just, just doesn't happen. What happens in that direction is a buckling problem, and we have to recognize that. And that buckling problem is the capacity of the gusset plate and tension. So that's new. It's not a, uniquely about bolts, but we're going to do it anyway. So there's the slip load. Now remember what I recall what I said a moment ago. It's going to go bang, bang. Trust me. Anytime I've given this before, we went bang, bang pretty fast. But this is so you have an exa a worked example 
that you can come back to. Okay. P value, clean mill scale, H sub F was about holes, uh, pardon me, about fills, but we don't have any. Area of the bolt, we need that, F sub U of the uh, bolts. Don't mix up F sub U and F sub Y of the plate stuff and the bolt stuff. Just be careful you're keeping those separate. And they're two slip planes. So you'll work these out in detail, and you get a number, 37.88 kips for that. So a slip load calculation, it's just number work now, so I'm not going to talk about each one. So it's 26, roughly, kips per bolt. We have eight, and so that's eight times whatever. It's 205. Uh, I'm using phi as one. This goes back to a, a, a test example. So we know everything. Phi is one. There's no uncertainty, in other words. So we did the test. Use phi of one. In your design, you're not using phi of one. So the shear resistance, oh, remember that? Yeah, that was the, we're going to use phi of one. We'll assume threads in the shear plane. We're going to assume reasonably short joints so there's no joint length, joint length effect. So I'm going to pause here. Do you remember that figure? Remember the nagging about what you missed and should have had in six, seven, uh, your mechanics and material course? Yeah, 0 0.62 times bolt ultimate tensile strength, but 90% of that, that's 68 kips per square inch. And then the number work comes spilling out. You can work that through. 525 kips. The bearing resistance, phi of one again, the 1.5 stuff and the 3 stuff, the excessive yielding and the bearing capacity. So you're going to work that out, a number, 47.1. The 1.5 stuff and a number, 41.2. Now, I would, I would use that as compared to 47.1. Some, some designers would say, well, part of it is yielding, and part of it is shearing out. So I'm going to use 47.1 sometimes and 41.2 some other times. My reaction is, this isn't, we're, we're not building watches here. Take the lowest one and use that. I, I don't think the information is that wonderful that I would be prepared to differentiate between the two cases. But I know some people do, and I, I guess indirectly I'm criticizing them. But I wouldn't do it that way. So you get numbers, 41.2. Bearing resistance, then you work that out. The block shear, new stuff for most of us. Remember the thing flying in there? Ah, yeah. Shear yield up and down the two sides. Tension fracture across the tip there. Got it? Easy to work out. The T sub R plus V sub R. Your specification rule will look different than this. I, I didn't check it for the 2010 one. It'll look more complicated. I urge you to say to yourself, this isn't complicated. This is simple. And it's more to the point, I guess. It's logical. So you're going to work that one out, making sure you keep bolt stuff and uh, plate stuff separate. And you get that number. I, I separated the tension stuff, that's 31 kips, and the shear stuff, uh, 128, I'll call it. But the total is what we're heading, 159. The brace force and compression, the issue is sway buckling. And uh, Brent, we're pretty close to the end, don't worry. Uh, there's three ways of looking at it that I'm aware of. The Whitmore method, which really checks yield. The Thornton method, which checks buckling. And modified Thornton, which checks buckling, but in a different way. So Whitmore said the load passes out of the first pair of bolts at 30 degree line. Check yielding at the base there. And that's okay. It, it, it's been around a long time, but it works for some cases and it doesn't work for some cases. And we shouldn't be using a design rule or approach that doesn't work for all cases. So I'm going to do it, but I don't have my heart in it. I wouldn't do it this way. It's sometimes that prediction is conservative, and sometimes it's non-conservative. Well, Thornton came along, and he's a smart guy, a good engineer, does a lot of AISC work. He said, this is not, 
I wasn't there, but I wish I had been. He said, this isn't a uh, yielding problem. It's a buckling problem. And he said, do this. And he doesn't have all afternoon to do it. So he says, take L1, L2, and L3. Spread the load out at 30 degrees, as you did for the other case. Take the longest of L1, L2, or L3. That's what he said originally. I think he now says, take the average. You know, use your judgment. Uh, and deal with it as a buckling problem. Be critical equals. And that's the way we should be doing it. The big uncertainty there would be, let's, uh, obviously I'm going to use L2. It's a buckling problem. I have to know the condition of the ends. Is it pin, pin, pin fixed, whatever. We don't, we don't really have a good handle on that. But 0.65 is the value that most people would use at this point. <clears throat> and modified Thornton came along and said, I can do it better. He's the one that had the test results. So he spreads the load out at 45 degrees. And it does do it better, but remember, he had uh, lots of information not available to the average designer. So looking at the right-hand column, uh, mean to standard deviation stuff for the physical test is 1.06. That's good agreement, and they got a good agreement because they had all the information. So we'll use that method. We'll now do the calculations. Um, just use a scale. Just use a scale drawing. Don't don't overkill with stuff like this. Uh, now the calculations, which I'm leaving for your perusal as designers, but just a reinforcement of k equals 0.65. You've got a one millimeter wide strip that's 9.6 millimeters wrong, long, and you have to make certain calculations, and you. Do that, and you get 132 kips. The test load on that specimen was 164. So that's, that's good agreement. It's not always that good. We need more tests in this area, but it's decent. This one is, is fairly conservative. It's 1.23, should be one or above. Uh, so this kind of, kind of conservative, this one test. They did 16 tests. This was one of them. And the corresponding ratios for Whitmore, which I wouldn't use, and Thornton, which I would use if I wanted to, uh, were uh, 1.31 and 1.8. So we've checked everything now. Obviously, you've kept this together in a spreadsheet, and you look at the results. This is a, this is a badly balanced design. It was never their intention that the hip bone be as strong as the tail bone be as strong as the... So you'd go back and you'd redesign these things. But it's in good agreement, and I hope the last seven minutes here have served to provide you with what did he really do at that step? What are the calculations? Now, some references. Uh, there's a, the load and resistance factor designed for the, from the Research Council on Structural Connections. We've given you the website. There's a free download available. This reference guide to design criteria, which is Kind of out of date now, but still good. There's a free download. GEISC, I know they're paying me, but they sure put out some good stuff. I mean, they pit, put out good stuff, and they try to not overcharge people. It's more important to get it on the shelf than to extract more money. For people, if it's a mechanical engineering application, this book by Bickford is very good. I recommend that as the source. And then there's the one that AISC published, Design Guide 17. It won't be up to date with, in terms of today's specification, but you'll find stuff there. And just, just out, uh, Larry Claver and Larry Muir wrote a uh, two or three page article about the changes uh, in the design of connections in modern steel construction. Oh, wasn't that, that was too fast, I know. But you were patient, you didn't throw things at the screen. Well, just one or two came through. And uh, we appreciate that. And I think uh, one of the AISC people is going to s support uh, the questioning. They're going to elaborate a little bit on how you can carry on with questions. And I encourage you to do that. Both uh, AISC has a really good questions and answer. What do you call it? The Steel Solution Center. Steel Solution Center. Really, that's where you you got to go there first. There's so many good things there. So I better stop, Brent, and you'll take over. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kulak.